Thank you all very much. Yeah, so just a quick check. Are you able to see the share screen of the presentation? Yeah, perfect. Thanks so much, Katie and John, uh, for hosting this last Science by the Glass event. I'm Tin Lin, uh, directing Multi Hazard Sustainability Research Group, Hazards in short, and I'm very excited to be here sharing with you probabilistic sea level rise hazard analysis, integrating climate science, engineering, and technology. I'm currently a faculty affiliate of the National Green Institute here at Texas Tech, and also Oh, are you able to see here? Yeah. And also the Climate Center, which is the host of today's event. So here on the left has an image of our co-director, Catherine Heho, together with President Obama and uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. And so here, we're here physically in Lubbock, Texas, but we also welcome online participants from everywhere, so acknowledge your time and um, your participation here, really appreciate. I know some of you have very early in Asia um, and also very late night in Europe. So with thanks to contributions from my hazards uh, research group students, I would love to share our journey from climate, from earthquakes to climate change here. So a bit about my background. I was raised a geotechnical engineer but at Cornell via the NIST Lifeline program, conducting numerical modeling for experimental testing of lifelines subjected to earthquake fault crossing, led by Dr. Tomo Rock et al. Between Cornell undergraduate research and um, Stanford PhD, I went to New York City and worked at Leslie E. Robinson Associates so had the opportunity to work with a couple of projects, both domestically and internationally. For instance, we had a lot of column de design fun for the National Library of Latvia, a landmark in Latvia inspired by nature. So you look at this, this sort of like a mountain-like structure. And down here domestically also, we work on Nazca Hall of Fame and Museum in Charlotte, North Carolina, and specifically, I was responsible for the ribbon. So this twisted elegant feature here that's um, design, that was uh, a dream of uh, architects like I am Pei. Fast forward to Stanford, one of the events that really changed my perspective was a field trip to Chile, Concepcion, after the 2010 Mole earthquake. The bit here is a picture I took in person of the collapse of the auto real tall building. I've seen pictures like this before in movies, in textbooks, but to witness them in person is so different. Never again, I said on that side. Later on, I also had the opportunity to go with the Seismological Society of America group for Earth Science Field Trip to Alaska on the 50th anniversary of the Alaska earthquake. So there, besides looking at paleo seismology, we also had the opportunity to witness firsthand too the accelerated glacier retreat of the Patach Glacier. There, I confirmed my interest in multi-hazard sustainability, investigating a range of hazards from earthquakes an example of short life extreme to sea level rise, an example of long term stressor. Meeting Gordon Wu from Risk Management Solutions, the London office, a decade ago has really broadened my horizon for our planet. So, this is a cover image of the book Calculating Catastrophe by Gordon from a decade ago. On the front page, there is volcano Ana Krakato. Down here, there's the equation depicting calculations. And if those of you who recognize a uh, Chinese character also here, D2 means our uh, planet of Earth. So for 
pretty complicated subjects like physics and mathematics and calculating catastrophe. Gordon was able to depict all of this like a novel. And in his prologue, he taught anything from German to Greek, from Einstein to Newton to Feynman, and what share the common themes as catastrophe, for instance, chaos, crisis. And he also further categorized hazards into two general, general categories, either natural examples, earthquakes, or societal example, pandemics. If you read the specific chapter on pandemics, that Gordon wrote a decade ago, it really depicts what we are going to in the past two years or so. His foresight is incredible. And he really challenged me to broaden my view and to venture into something else, to think about how we can apply strength in one field to solve tough problems of another. Landing on the most beautiful place in our planet of Earth, according to my academic kid, my first PhD student. This is uh, visiting my PhD student in his home country, Croatia, basically passing from the passion and knowledge for paid for, just like what Gordon did to me. And recently, events in Croatia, Texas, and beyond really inform us a lot from the catastrophes and also future learning from catastrophes that are recently and then inform future science engineering. For instance, soon after the pandemic started, Croatia experienced a big earthquake. So it was a combination of earthquake pandemic and also happens on very cold weather in hospitals where moms and newborns were forced to evacuate outside. Later in 2020, December 29th, there is also a sequence of earthquakes again, and again, that combination of earthquake and pandemic. So there I work alongside my PhD student who is the field lead for the reconnaissance deployed right after the earthquake, and a group of earthquake engineers around the world for STEER, ERI, ERI stands for Earthquake Engineering Research Institute Learning from Earthquake program to document this earthquake to inform future science engineering and policy. And here, right here in Texas, last year, 2 February, we also have first-hand experience of severe winter storm. We became part of FEMA disaster declaration zone. Many of us experienced loss of power, internet, heat, and even water. Later last year, August 29th, Hurricane Ida hit Louisiana coast. Its impact also extended all the way back to New England areas with scenes that mimic those from New York subway stations, such as the movie, The Day After Tomorrow. With that, I work with a group of wind engineering colleagues to document this event as part of this year of uh, reconnaissance again, deployed one hour after the landfall. So in terms of earthquakes and sea level rise, those are the two key hazards that my research group investigate. So why those two? So if you look at past loss, 40% of deaths from natural disasters occur as a result of earthquakes. Looking to future exposure, 40% of our population, either in the United States right here or around the world live in coastal areas. So I embark on a journey then from earthquakes to climate change. So here I'll give a little bit of summary of integrating my previous effort in integrating earthquake science um, and in engineering technology, if you will. So in the case of structural engineering, where I got my PhD um, degree in, 
and then also geophysics where I venture further after my PhD, and then also surrounding deeply wise high performance computing that really enable a lot of the computations. And this specific advancement is in the area of ground motion simulation validation of tall buildings. I like to acknowledge the funding agencies for a number of awards over the years and alongside the high performance computing resources. So here in the figure depicting basically on the left hand side, recordings of earthquake, past earthquake database basically. That's the entire database from Pacific Earthquake Engineering, Earthquake Engineering Center headquartered at Berkeley. On the right hand side, that's simply physics-based simulations for term cyber shit in the Los Angeles downtown area, just one side. So from here, you can see that the cyber shit simulations at one side alone cover a wider range of probability of exceedance of target earthquake response spectra than the entire database across the world. So that really motivated us to look beyond traditional empirical data to look into physics-based simulations. And I won't delve into the details of some of their um, definitions and kind of what is I used for it. Uh, you could, for instance, refer to my previous encyclopedia of earthquake engineering country on conditional spectra that now became a uh, part of um, ASC, American Society of Sub Engineering, a building code update, and also um, building code guidelines, um, building analysis guidelines. So, in terms of models, I kind of try to kind of have the same theme across earthquake and, and sea level rise and, and climate, uh, climate change broadly. So, essentially, have models. So, what kind of model, for instance, here, cyber sheet I mentioned, is a combination of physics based and probabilistic seismic hazard analysis. So, beauty, marriage of two worlds. In terms of sources and scenarios, it basically goes through geophysics. So, it's going from the rupture wave propagation all the way to the resulting waveforms. And as engineers, we can then pick that up and then look at what is the earthquake hazard to rest. Rest, for example, tall building collapse, the example I, did, I, I have the picture of um, back in Chile. So this really enables us to look at a wide range, basically from rupture all the way to response. So why then, why all this? I kind of uh, know that earlier on, the ground motion database, the core recordings are limited. So very few recordings for large, large magnitude earthquakes and short distance events. But those are typically the most damaging ones. So then we could supplement those with a physics-based site-specific simulation, like the ones that are depicted on the right-hand side of the right figure here, for instance, in Los Angeles downtown, where a lot of tall buildings are located. But that is computationally very expensive. So that's when high-performance computing comes in to help us perform, for instance, 2 million nonlinear dynamic analysis, from which then we can, we can explore further the relationship between, um, for instance, intensity measure I am in short for the hazard side, and then engineering demand parameter EDP in short for the structural response. So here are some sample epic, uh, publications um, all authored by former PhD students uh, in a number of journals, uh, earthquake, for instance, earthquake engineering and structural dynamics is a more like earthquake engineering journal, and then uh, earthquake spectra sort of a earthquake science and engineering type of journal. And then Bulletin of Seismological Society of uh, America, that's more the earthquake science side, documenting some of the um, advancements in this area. And both uh, uh, BLH and, and John are now doctors. And so I won't delve into more details, but just kind of a, uh, gave a, or also a link here um, from Pure uh, YouTube channel that I gave her an opening, an invited talk right after opening last year, kind of about documenting some of their decadal advancement in this field. So shifting gear a bit, 
to climate science, and what I see is really an earthquake parallel back at the Bella Center, Copenhagen, Denmark, 2009, where the United Nations Climate Change Conference was held. So there, I had the dream, vision for sea level rise applications. So here, introducing today's topic, PSLRHA, probabilistic sea level rise hazard analysis. So you look at this figure here by Alexander Dahl, prior to COP15, the United Nations Climate Change Conference, you could see sea level rise basically from the IPCC Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Predictions, the, uh, the gray range of predictions, alongside observations from tidal gauges and satellite observations. And what you see here is previously IPCC predictions when they came up, people thought that was way high for sea level rise. But what happened is when we collected more data, look at, for instance, the satellite observation data, and consistent with the tidal gauge data, they actually lie on the upper bound. And we could use a bunch of different models, just like what we did in earthquake. In earthquake engineering, we do have ground motion prediction models. And here in climate science, for instance, for me and Ranstoff in their 2009 PNAS paper documented their somehow empirical method for projecting sea level rise to the end of the century based on a range of emission scenarios. So then I thought in my head, slow parallel here, so earthquake and sea level rise, they both have the models, they both have the various scenarios, You've got to kind of account for the sources, and then also think about the method that could be common. So that's why I propose the conceptual framework of probabilistic sea level rise hazard analysis published in Sustainable Civil Infrastructures, Hazards, Risk, and Uncertainty. So what can we use this kind of framework for? So one utility here is hazard map. For instance, the US Geological Survey does have a national seismic hazard map for the United States that in turn inform our building codes, our civil and structural engineering to make buildings more earthquake resistant. And if you look at a global scale, the global earthquake model headquarter in Pavia, Italy, take that further to cover more countries. So why not global sea level rise hazard map? And similarly, from our previous uh, publication in BSSA, we account for aleatory uncertainties and epistemic uncertainties from earthquake magnitude, distance, as well as there are ground motion prediction models. And we could do the forward process of coming up with hazard total hazard, we could also do the reverse process of deaggregation, meaning conditional on a specific level shaking what is the relative contribution from various events or models. So taking that further, we could do exactly the same thing also for sea level rise, looking at the source contribution and also how the models are predicting various sea level rise uh, thresholds. And similarly, from our ESD paper sequence for performance-based engineering, we kind of propose different methods for intensity-based and risk-based assessments uh, from earthquake hazard to risk. So we could also take that further to say, what if performance-based sea level rise engineering? So that was the vision back in the Bella Center 2009 and then resulted in 20. 12 conceptual framework publication about where are we today? So essentially, there's a, a, a further a step, initial step of integrating civil engineering and climate science via this uh, probability sea level rise hazard analysis. So kind of comparing this a bit with the previous ones on earthquake. Again, we have models. Now, what kind of models? We have general circulation models, GCMs in short. We have ice sheet models, glacier models. And then what kind of sources contributing to sea level rise? We have, for instance, ocean thermal expansion or, or thermal static, as you see in the literature. You could also have ice melting from glaciers and ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica. 
in terms of scenarios, we could have emission scenarios from the previous generations or more recent generations, such as the representative concentration pathways that enable us to project future climate change, including sea level rise. So in my paper with uh, former PhD student uh, Matt Thomas in the Journal of Climate, we have an illustrative analysis of the probabilistic sea level rise hazard, depicting, for instance, this global sea level rise hazard map in terms of probability of drawing um, projections of sea level rise accounting for all various sources of contribution from thermosteric to glacier to ice sheet melting with various thresholds of sea level rise exceedance. If we were to kind of zoom into some of the components, for instance, the uh, ocean thermal expansion piece or thermosteric piece, we could also look at the dual model here that we propose for emulation of thermosteric and dynamic sea level change published in climatic change. We realized that a lot of the climate simulation projections are very computationally expensive. So in order to come up with a computationally efficient way to look at future projections, we propose the dual or the nonlinear response model to capture both the short-term and long-term effects, very much inspired by Vermeer and Ransdorf um, in their original PNAS paper. Back then, it was for temperature change. Now, it's for radio uh, forcing, kind of go all the way from the climate forcing to sea level rise. And we see that our models outperform the current linear models um, over a range of growth, uh, general circulation models and um, representative concentration pathways, so GCM and RCPs. That's up to 2100. If we were to extend that even further, that's uh, what the ERCP extended our uh, representative uh, concentration pathway was for. So essentially, we can then go all the way into 2300, and you see the nonlinear models depict larger difference and also more consistency with the direct simulations. And from which we could essentially, viewing the current computation gaps, for instance, on the right hand side, bottom left figure, we could have all the uh, red lines or the direct illustrative uh, GCM projections. And then we could also do emulated ones. So using our proposed model, we can fill in the gaps for extended period of time. So for instance, some of the simulations only have up to 2100. We could use our method to extend that further to 2300. And then we could even do some of those that don't have any simulations right now. And from which we could then take the global mean and then distribute them over the growth via pattern scaling from global to regional sea level change. So from our previous study, both the 2012 uh, framework in terms of uh, as, um, anticipating largest uh, uncertainty sources from ice melting and confirmed later in the 2020 illustration, we wanted to talk, tackle the toughest piece, which is ice melting, because that's the largest uh, contribution in terms of uncertainty for future sea level rise projection. Hence, the hyperthermal computing enable ice sheet response, tracing sea level rise all the way back to polar regions, including Greenland and Antarctica. So this was the first proposal in AGU, presented at AGU meeting, and now is a paper, journal paper um, in press in climate dynamics with current PhD student here at Texas Tech, Xiao Wu. So we might kind of go back to the big picture, like why do we even care? So essentially, future decision making really relies a lot on sea level rise. For instance, from back in 2009, UNFCCC, so these are pictures I took in Copenhagen when I attended the United Nations Climate Change Conference. So that uh, UNFCCC stands for United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, and then that's kind of how a lot of climate science would then inform policy globally. And down here, there is also installment uh, in Copenhagen 
that's term that's titled Don't Jump Our Futures. You a couple of kids kind of in the um, oceans here kind of thinking about sort of like what's the future looking like. And last year, Christopher Flavel in the New York Times talk about tiny town, big decisions, what are we willing to pay to fight the rising sea? Here I've depicted on the bottom right, a staircase in North Carolina once helped beach goers cross a sand deal is now in water. And more and more of this is happening around the world. And a lot of these messages that we're had, our hearing are consistent throughout. For instance, Nobel Prize Summit last year, our planet, our future, sort of having a combination of um, talks given uh, on various days, uh, first day of our planet, uh, led by Al Gore, and then breakthroughs, second day breakthroughs, led by Mashira Manal, the president of the National Academy of Sciences, and then third day of future, led by our family known name by now, uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci. So think about sort of how the climate health intertwine and how some of the science, engineering, technology could help inform our future. So back to our research, how our, our probably six sea level rise hazard analysis has been used. So currently, it has been our framework and the illustrative analysis have been used for population exposure estimates for future migration due to sea level rise. It has been used also for mental health or psychological impact of sea level rise, potentially retreat. And it has also most recently um, been cited by the 2021 report of the Lancet Countdown on Health and Climate Change Code Red for Healthy Future, specifically for sea level rise projections due to ice melting uncertainties. So this is for those of you who are not familiar with this um, report, uh, the, the Lancet is a medical journal. I think we saw some medical colleagues here from medical field. And this, um, space, space, this, this is uh, the Lancet counter basically represents the consensus of leading researchers from 43 academic institutions and the United Nations agency. So there's a lot of uh, also cross cutting themes in terms of climate and health. So back to also kind of where I belong and in terms of my area is structural engineering. So ASC, American Society of Civil Engineering, uh, Structural Engineering Institute, ASC, ASCI. I've been chairing the um, Committee on Advances in Information Technology, basically positioning ourselves as users, adopters, early adopters of various advanced technologies to advance the field of structural engineering for the future. So now here in back in 2017, this was the first collaboration between Structural Engineering Institute and the National Academies of Sciences for basically three key ideas that I had that drove into this uh, initially a proposal then a workshop hosted by the National Academies is structural engineering kind of where uh, my view of the expertise in, is in, advanced technology, the, the community I chair, and then plus resilient communities. So thinking about disaster resilience, almost back to the earlier picture of uh, Gordon's calculating catastrophe. How can we use all of this? And this um, then resulted in the 2020 uh, National Academy's press publication. And back in 2018 uh, to 2019, I was also part of the effort on uh, Structural Engineering Institute Board of Governors um, level committee on confirmation update for vision for the future. So I was responsible for draft uh, for writing hmm, the vision for the future of structural engineering and structural engineer is a case for change towards 2033, specifically in the technology section and also multi disciplinary cooperation, basically across various fields, including computer science and climate science. Currently, I'm also guest editing a Journal of Structural Engineering special collection on the same thing, advances in information technology towards vision for the future of structural engineering and encouraging scientists, engineers, and technologists to contribute to our effort together.
I guess about one to two months of upon arrival at Texas Tech, um, I hosted the German uh, US Infrastructure Resilience Infrared Workshop, supported by the German um, Federal Foreign Office, so kind of equivalent of uh, this uh, Department of State here, as part of the, the uh, year of German US uh, friendship. And the topic back then was advancing infrastructure resilience, mastering extremes in complex environments. So we cover a range of different hazards from wind to sea level rise, to earthquakes, to droughts, and then a, a range of environments from our regular civil infrastructure to what we're really concerned about here as well, agriculture in the region. So this theme of integrating science, engineering, and technology is kind of uh, throughout my research group in both the earthquake track and the climate change track. So I see it as a parallel track with my original field of study of earthquake engineering, but venture out this uh, climate science as a side adventure. So currently, um, the climate branch of my research group mm -hmm. For instance, um, Xiao Ru is uh, working on a, a site semi empirical framework for ice sheet response analysis under oceanic forcing in Talika and Greenland to be published in um, Climate Dynamics, essentially tackling the piece of polar ice melting that contributes most uncertainty to future sea level rise projections. And a student, Keith Okoski, looking more in the engineering side looking at Harris County locally drainage system in the face of tropical cyclones and heavy rainfall events. And he's going to present in Athens, Greece at the third international conference on natural hazards and infrastructure. So he is going to talk about the story of the flooding in Houston and also in general Gulf of Mexico area due to recent events. So you see, for instance, his presentation in terms of the, how the hazard has been changing and pre-Hurricane Harvey, post-Hurricane Harvey, and into the future, and what that would imply for the future in terms of solutions in both civil infrastructure, civil infrastructure strengthening and nature-based solutions. Is another student, um, Alan Gonzalez, working on translated emission pathways, TEP, so sort of parallel the RCPs, representative uh, concentration pathways, thinking about long-term simulations of COVID-19 uh, CO2 emissions and thermostatic sea level rise projections, essentially connecting the various phases of the pandemic and their resulting emissions and visualizing them as sea level rise to help science communication and corny impress for the journal Earth's future. So again, back to where we are here. So really thanks to uh, many thanks to the host here at the Climate Center at Texas Tech. So this is kind of, they asked me a bunch of uh, questions and one of them is how to help the world in small ways. And I said, I maximize individual talent and collective wisdom. So the Climate Center in turn, in turn kind of have this fun sketch on, on the left here. On the right, this is exactly what we're doing in my research group, Multi-Hazard Sustainability, tackling various catastrophes from earthquake to sea level rise, including ice melting in the polar regions, trying to connect science and engineering. So really, a lot of this is standing on the shoulders of giants. What I am presenting today, probably six sea level rise hazard analysis, PSLRHA, in short, is pretty much inspired by as a uh, probabilistic seismic hazard analysis, PSHA, in the earthquake world, plus climatic change. So I'd like to recognize two individuals who really inspired this work. Professor Alan Cornell, father of modern earthquake risk analysis and of a Nobel winner. So his son, Eric Cornell, is a Nobel Prize winner in physics. His seminal paper that really started the field of probably six seismic hazard analysis, published in the Bulletin of Seismological Society of America, really changed our ways of seeing from hazard to risk and how to inform structural engineering. And he, together with his advisor, PhD advisor, Benjamin, 
author, co-author a uh, super engineering textbook that forever changed our way of thinking, introducing probability statistics and decision making. Another one, Professor Stephen H. Schneider. He's a founder, founding father of modern climate science and also a share of the Nobel Prize via the IPCC uh, together with our board. He is the founder of the journal Climatic Change, really ahead of his time back in 1978. His seminal paper that linked climate science to policy in nature is really intriguing. The title is What is Dangerous Climate Change? On the left, this is a picture I took of him at Copenhagen, Denmark, 2009, at COP15, while he's signing science as a context for the book that he authored. He's really a fierce leader to the very last second of his life. The next year, 2010, on his way from his flight from Sweden back to London, he passed away. So a lot of what I'm doing here is really thanks to, to people who have done a lot of work before us and also their unfinished gyms. So here on a mission to make a difference. Talking about COP15, this is a picture that we took early morning in the Baula Center back in Copenhagen when a group of us, our Stanford students, talking with leaders in the field, so including some of those who are really influ influential later on, for instance, Christiana Figueres, who accomplished Mission Impossible, basically persuading many, many countries to eventually join Paris Agreement. We also crossed the bridge to the other side from Copenhagen, Denmark to Sweden to look at sustainability, the Copenhagen COP15 Swedish initiative. Some of the efforts I mentioned earlier on, German US uh, infrastructure resilience workshop hosted here at Texas Tech, we also had a follow up event and via the Global Resilient Research Network Summit in Freiburg, Germany, where my collaborators uh, headquarter um, is at. From over EMI. So, really benefit from a lot of these kinds of uh, discussions and, and um, advancement. So, here's a fun one 2017 is uh, a, so by Athens, and I didn't enjoy it, I said, kind of after the classic marathon meeting to National Technical University of Athens to meet up with my colleagues or uh, students and having a, a bunch of uh, these academic discussions. So I say, kind of in the spirit of science by the glass, this is really research without borders. Let's increase the frequency, intensity, and duration, not of hazards, not of those that are depicted by Gordon, but of technical and philosophical discussion. With that, from Mozart's opera, thank you all for your time and attention.